Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelSportsRadio.com Check out the Israel Sports Radio store by clicking on the store tab on IsraelSportsRadio.com Great items such as t-shirts, hats, books, and much, much more. Price does include shipping, and we do ship throughout the entire world. All major credit cards are accepted to make your shopping experience easy and convenient. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. Live from Studio C at the Cherry Hill campus for the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, it's Sports Talk. Welcome to another edition of Sport and All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, simulcasted as the Yossi G Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. It's a wonderful, absolutely beautiful day that we had today. First day of spring, first official day of spring. It certainly felt like it, and I was in a really chipper mood. And I'm still in a pretty happy mood right now, especially considering we have coming on a little later on the show, we're going to have Kyle Echo, former Eagle and Super Bowl winner with the Saints. He'll be joining me shortly to talk about NFL free agency. We got some NBA stuff to talk about. Of course, I had a little insight uh, for last night's fan protest in New York, protesting the not the Phil Jackson hiring for the Knicks or by the Knicks, but the ownership of James Dolan and how he has pretty much buried the Knicks in their grave, and essentially they don't really have much of where to climb out from. We consider where they sit right now in the Eastern Conference, and you look at the Eastern Conference, it is not a good place to play. If you're between the top three, four teams and the rest of the conference, it's like night and day. And even in that case, even in the Western Conference, the Knicks still don't even stand a puncher's chance of making the postseason. But with that said, of course, uh, we have today starting, as everybody knows, the Group of 64, the uh, official portion of what we all like to know as the NCAA Tournament Final Four, March Madness, however it is, or the road to the Final Four, rather, March Madness, however it is that you know it. And we already had earlier today one upset that was Dayton beating Ohio State 60-59. to And we'll keep you uh, a little updated a little later on with what's going on uh, at, with our sports update as we, uh, as we chug along over here on allnoiseradio.com's Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi. As always, you want to chime in 856-330-4749 or you can send me a tweet at the Yussie, G-T-H-E. Y-O-S-S-I-G. That is my Twitter handle. Or you can send me a message on Facebook, facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi. First off the bat, uh, we got some NFL things. Now, I want to talk about some of the signings and some of the players that have, and, and one specific player that has not been signed yet, uh, likely will be signed in the next 24 to 48 hours. First off, Darrell Revis, going to the Patriots, spurning the Jets, for Darrell Rivas' career, this is a fabulous move. Uh, I mean, he looks after himself. He leaves Tampa. He goes for the, I guess, the most secure chance or shot at a title by signing with New England. And at the same time, he's also able to screw the Jets twice a year when the teams face off against one another. He knows the Jets system very well and certainly will be able to help Bill Belichick, not like really Belichick has needed a lot of help over the years to beat the Jets, but still, whatever Revis can add for emphasis and add the add that exclamation point, he certainly will do that for the Patriots. And when you look at how the spurning the Jets and going to the Patriots, of all teams that Revis could go to in the NFL— or in the AFC, he chooses a team from the AFC East. And not only does he choose a team from the AFC East, it could have been the Bills. It could have been the Dolphins, but no. Jets fans are saying he had to choose the Patriots. Well, look, here's the deal. The Jets, in the course of their history, 
And, of course, most recently, they've screwed other players over too. The most notable example has been Tim Tebow. They released Tebow after the draft, after the teams that could have had a use for him, at least to bring him into their organization and try him out and see if he could fit in. But no, the Jets released him after the draft, after those teams that could have needed him filled those needs through the draft or through trades on draft day and essentially ended Tebow's career. So the Jets getting a taste of its own medicine Probably not the end of the world. Probably keeps staying at a nice even keel for that for Gang Green. And considering the fact that they were really going after Dominic Rogers Cromarty, that's Antonio Cromarty's cousin. Cromarty signed with the Giants, signs five years, nineteen million guaranteed, with the Eagles who drafted him. It was uh you know, he was less than stellar in his play with the Birds in Philadelphia. He had, his rookie season wasn't so good. His second year was okay in the beginning, and then uh, towards the end of the year, tailed off extremely, like exponentially tailed off. And in Denver, he was near lights out. I mean, you could not really get a ball completed in his direction. That's how well he played in mile high. So he's been a mixed bag so far, and I think that the Jets missed out on him is only really only hampers the fact that his cousin Antonio Camardi today signed with the Arizona Cardinals. So the Jets really the only way that they're going to be able to do anything uh, for the cornerback position going forward is either going to be through trades or through the draft because there really isn't any cornerback of any great shakes that is still available. In through, in through free agency. So that they miss out DRC is it's unfortunate, but I don't think it's that bad because it all depends. His play all depends on how the team is playing overall. He won't be that beacon of hope, that shining light out there in the distance when the seas are all storming and raging around him. If the team, if the ship is going down, He's going to be that captain going down with that ship. He's not going to try to save himself or try to save uh, the season, so to speak, by helping his teammates. No, if the team is not playing well, he won't end up playing well. Case point is his, his, his last year with the Eagles. So that he signed with the Giants, it's, it's fine with the Giants because they need some help as well, just like the Jets. But it will all depend in terms of expectations from DRC, from Dominic rogers Camardi, how the Giants play this season. If the Giants get out of the gates playing well, you will see DRC giving you the effort that he gave you when he was in Denver last year. But if the Giants come out stumbling and don't really get their feet under them until they're like 2-5 and five or 3-7 and seven or something like that, you will see DRC, you will watch Dominic rogers Camardi play just like he played in Philly. A lot of missed tackles, a lot of questionable effort. It's all going to be the rage again. So that's where I look at Dominic rogers Camardi, and it's a very big question mark in terms of how he'll play. Darrell Rivas, you know, he's he's got something to prove. DRC, that's always been the question with him, is if he felt like he had something to prove to somebody even if everybody was expecting him to prove something. 856-330-4749, you want to hop in, we will get you on the line, or you can always send me a tweet at the Yossi, G-T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G on Twitter, or a Facebook message, facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk with the Sports Rab. I'm getting in a, a question here. Uh, this is coming from Big Jets fan 813 uh, It says, Eric Decker goes to the Jets. Is that a good move or not? Really? Anybody who comes to the Jets who is better than Jeremy Curley and better and can catch a pass more often than Stephen Hill is better than what they have already. Santonio San Holmes is the diva that exited stage left. So the Jets really, yeah, they overpaid for Eric Decker because he's not a number one receiver. He's a very good number two receiver. He played in Peyton Manning's offense in Denver, so you know there's going to be a little bit of inflated numbers, but that said, he can still play. He can still ball, and he can still catch. So 
you have to pay him. You being the Jets, you have to overpay him a little bit to get him to come to you. And it's a very good move for the Jets because they needed to bolster what was essentially a Division II wide receiving core. The Jets overpaid for Decker, but they had to in order to bring some substantiality, somebody with a little bit of substance and somebody who has a little bit of a track record to the team for Geno Smith to throw to. Santonio Holmes is gone. Jeremy Curley, Stephen Hill are the only names, so to speak, that are left on this roster, and they're not even that good. So Eric Decker coming to the Jets, good move. You have to overpay for him. Hopefully the Jets will get a couple of more uh, good wide receivers either through the trade, uh, through through the, through trades or through free agency. And we're gonna talk to I'm gonna talk to Kyle Eichel about the potentiality for somebody like Deshaun Jackson ending up in uh, uh, ending up with the Jets in a green in another type of a green uniform, another shade of green, and possibly the idea floating around that Michael Vick is expected to sign with the Jets within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it should be interesting to see and uh, you know what happens with those Jets. And, of course, uh, the big question that I've been hearing a lot of people asking the la- you know, since free agency opened up was T.J. Ward, safety, going to Denver, and not where a lot of people were thinking or hoping or expecting him to go to Philly. And... That doesn't sit so well with me because I felt that Philadelphia, the Eagles, should have paid Ward the money that he got from Denver. When you look at what Ward got, when you look at what Malcolm Jenkins got from Philly, the guaranteed money is not all that different. A couple million dollars. But we're not paying that. That's something that Harry Roseman, the GM for the Eagles, has to worry about. Not me. Not you, the fan. When you look at somebody like T.J. Ward, he is a guy who can stop the run up the middle. He's a guy who brings it. He's rated as the second best safety to Jairus Bird in this free agent class. And he goes to Denver for a couple more million dollars than what you gave a guy who sucks. I mean, quite frankly, Malcolm Jenkins is not a good safety. I'm not getting all fit to be tied about the number of years and the amount of money that the contract is. I'm looking at the guaranteed money. That's really where I draw my line in the sand. T.J. Ward is not making that much more than Malcolm Jenkins, and yet he goes to Denver and not to Philly. Why? The only thing I can possibly think of, and we're gonna, I'm going to make sure to ask this to, to Echo, to Kyle Echo when he comes on shortly, is... Did the Eagles stay away from T.J. Ward because of his injury-riddled season that he had last year? He was in and out most of the season with a shoulder injury, and we know that he didn't play 100%. But even so, when he did play, he played pretty darn well. So you might, you, I mean, there's room to argue to say that, oh, they didn't want to take a chance with somebody who has that injury situation. But look at on the other side, he played through pain. He played very well while dealing with the issues that he had last season. Eight five six three three zero four seven four nine. When I come back from this commercial break, bring to you a former Navy midshipman, former Eagles fullback, and Super Bowl winner with the Saints, Kyle Echo, will be joining me to discuss some NFL radio powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting simulcasted as the Yussie G Show for IsraelSportsRadio.com. It's been 48 years Connecticut School of Broadcasting has helped place thousands of people just like you in exciting careers in radio, television, and the new media. At Connecticut School of Broadcasting, our hands-on approach is different. It's designed to have you spend less time in the classroom and more time in the studios. From the first day, you'll work with state-of-the-art equipment, Learn by doing from our team of industry professionals who come from their studios to ours. The best part about it, you'll learn it all in a matter of months, not years. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. So do what I did. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO. Step into the fast-paced world of the broadcast media. Day and evening classes begin soon. Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Get trained and get connected now. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. 
your computer is blowing up. Blowing up to the sounds of all noise radio. Powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. And all noise radio powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. As always, 856-330-4749. And you can also reach out to me on Twitter at the Yussi, G-T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G. And on Facebook, facebook.com, I search for sports. Of course, this show is also simulcasted as the Yussi G Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. Uh, a little later on in the show, we're going to have a little bit of a soccer update. Seeing what's going on in, the, in, in Europe with European soccer and also the World Cup preview a little bit of a world cup update we're going to have on Juan Arango he is a, a he covers the Bundesliga the German uh, federal league in Germany I'm going to joining me a little later on in the show and we're going to have on shortly Kyle Echo former Eagle former Saints Super Bowl winner with the Saints back in 2009 we'll talk some free agency going on Deshaun Jackson really kind of strikes me as the type of player who's very lost in his own little world and is not necessarily the most certain of what type of player he really should be and when you take him and you kind of ruffle his feathers it really doesn't always do you the best good at the end of the day looks like we have our man of the hour right now former navy midshipman former philadelphia eagle and saints super bowl winner kyle echo joining me right now on sports talk with the sports rabbi simulcasted as the scg show kyle what's going on man hey not much bro how are you very good very good so right off the bat you know you played in new orleans and you played with my uh, with malcolm jenkins what do you take from the eagles bringing him in versus somebody like a tj ward yeah that's a good question i think malcolm jenkins is an improvement to this secondary, but I don't think he's a difference maker. He's not, he's certainly not one on the field. He's not a takeaway guy. He's not a turnover guy. Uh, he's certainly not a big play guy. But again, when you're trying to fix something that is broken at the Eagle secondary, it doesn't take too much to, to make it better. So, you know, I think we have a guy out there who's, who's more capable of, of doing a good job. But if anybody's expecting Lonnie Lott out there, I think uh, we should take, take a deep breath. And, and hold your horses. Well, I know a lot of people were hoping that the Eagles were going to bring in uh, T.J. Ward uh, as a possible uh, upgrade in, uh, in the safety position, but you went, uh, do you think perhaps that they were scared, Howie Roseman was scared a little bit, the fact that Ward was injured often in the last year or so? No, you know, I think, uh, I think Ward probably commanded a little too much money for what they liked, and... Uh, I think Ward probably took maybe a little less money to go to Denver, and I, you know, I'm not sure if there's a, if there's ever been any reports on that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Just not too much money, but a little bit less. Right. Um, so I think that's probably what happened. Uh, but again, T.J. Ward and Malcolm Jenkins are, are are different kinds of safeties. That's also another factor. Although I would I would argue that T.J. Ward does everything better than Malcolm Jenkins. Although T.J. Ward is primarily a strong safety. I would still say it does everything better, and it's not like the Eagles can't use a strong safety, am I right? That's right. They can use whatever help they can get in the safety <laughs> exactly. position. Exactly. And, uh, and certainly looks like they have a little bit of an upgrade. If you could even imagine that they got an upgrade on offense, but it looks like that was the case when they brought in Darren Sproles. They tr- swapped him for a fifth rounder. What do you take from that trade by bringing in Sproles, bringing him to Philadelphia? Is this the type of guy that makes Chip Kelly salivate? Week in, week out, as he prepares for Sunday. I think so. I think Chip Kelly got wide eyes when uh, probably Roseman brought the idea to his attention. Again, I think Chip Kelly has final say in all roster moves. You know, this is a guy who was in serious demand coming out of Oregon for several years, finally took a job, and there's no way he took a job where he had no control over over personnel. So this is a guy who I think probably, uh, you know, really pulled the trigger himself on Darren Sproles. And yeah, again, this is a guy who makes people miss in open space. He, yeah, he's getting a little old, he's getting a little older now. He was banged up a bunch last year with some uh, some ankle problems. I think it was. I'm not too sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so he's getting a little older, but he's still plenty explosive. He's plenty dangerous, and uh, it's just a great weapon to have in the open field. So and I think it's exciting. I think uh, Eagles fans have uh, have a have a lot to watch. That ball could be good. To, that ball could go to anybody and go the distance. Well, you you mentioned that Chip Kelly probably came into the Philadelphia organization with the control that was that was given to him, like he had at Oregon, but to to a certain degree as well with the Eagles. 
when you talk about the roster and being in control of who comes, who goes, who stays, what's going on with the Sean Jackson? I mean, all these rumors are swirling, and all the Eagles or all the that Chip Kelly really has to do is call for one press conference or get Grant, maybe a Jeff Mosher type guy, an interview that says, we want him, he's staying, and that will squash all the rumors, squelch all the rumblings. What do you make with that, the Eagles are leaving this kind of to fester. The rumors going around of where Deshaun Jackson may be, how much he might be traded for. What do you make of all this? That's a good question again. And I, uh, I'm i really disappointed in the rumors, and I'm disappointed that they haven't squashed it. So that only leads me to believe that there is some truth to it. You know, I think uh, the Eagles don't want to get into a dialogue with the media about who they might cut or who they're going to, or who they're going to hold on to. I think they want to, you know, keep their business private, not just from the media, but from other organizations as well. Right. So yeah, I think that that factors in. But again, I mean, in my personal opinion: this team is in no right to be subtracting anything. They need to add to this team. Deshaun Jackson does more on that field than anybody can possibly see through statistics. He he pulls safeties out of out into coverage. He makes more space underneath. Riley Cooper. And Jeremy Macklin and Selleck and all these guys, all the, e- even LaShawn McCoy running the ball has a lot of space in the second level because the safeties are pulled back far deep in coverage because Deshaun Jackson, they have to respect his speed. And watch, just watch. If Deshaun Jackson is not on this team next year, watch how small the windows are for Nick Foles to throw. Watch how much smaller they get. It, everybody will wonder what's going on. And the reason is the safeties are now not, they're not 40 yards back. They're, they're 20 yards back, and there's a lot less room to throw. There's less room to run, and there's just less, less more explosive and, and big playability. Well, that'll be interesting to see because as soon if that is going to be the case and Michael Vick is not on the roster, you might be hearing a lot of people clamoring for Michael Vick to be why – why was he released? Why was he allowed to walk? Why didn't they bring him back? And talking about oh, yeah, Vick, he, you know, th- there's, there's a lot of rumors – that are going around now that Michael Vick and the New York Jets are very, very close to, to coming to a deal, to coming to a contract. What, what, do you, what have you been hearing about the Vick situation? Would you expect any other organization? I mean, you know, really, it's, a, it's been a circus there since I've, since I've uh, been, you know, conscious of football. And certainly <laughs> with, with Ryan out there, it's, a, it's just a disaster since day one, even though their defense was spectacular the first several years he was there. It's just been a disaster. He's the coach... He's, a, he's just 100% distraction. The offensive coordinator said that if he could run, the, if he could throw the ball every down, he would. Uh, Geno Smith was a, a terrible pick, in my opinion. He proved that this year, although he was a rookie. Maybe he does improve, but they still got Sanchez. They're going to bring in Vic. It's going to create more quarterback controversy. It's just it's a circus out there, and I, frankly, I feel bad for for Jets fans more than anybody. I just I really do, and. And it, it, it's a shame they took the bait when they signed, you know, the coach and uh, and they signed uh, Sanchez and Geno Smith even in the draft. They took the bait, they cheered, and they and they and they and they, they hoorahed all the way to uh, you know where they're at now. Well, certainly uh, there's a lot to be said for Jets fans, and I'm joined now with Kyle Eckel, former Super Bowl winner with the Saints and former Eagles player, uh, fullback. And when you look at Michael Vick and the whole situation, as you mentioned, with the Jets and what they have, what they bring to the table, how much controversy they've created that is only big enough for not only two, not only, you know, rather, not only the Big Apple, but also it's New Jersey as well. So you got two states dealing with one team's controversy and plenty enough to go around. Michael Vick, though, you bring him into New York, you bring him into the Jets organization, he's the type of guy who has a development already with Marty Mornenweg. He's got that mm-hmm. chemistry going on with their offensive coordinator, and he's the type of guy who can probably be a very good mentor to Geno Smith, who, if they bring in Michael Vick, I believe Vick will beat out Smith in the offseason for the starter's role. What do you think the Jets' uh, viewpoint on Michael Vick is going forward about the potentiality of bringing him into their organization to well, beef it up? I, I agree with what you just said about him mentoring Geno and uh, maybe even if they take another quarterback in this draft, who knows what the Jets are going to do. But... Uh, yeah, he has, he, he, he's matured over the years. He's become a really good teammate. I mean, he's really held the Eagles locker room together last year. The Eagles would not have had the chemistry, especially at the beginning of the season with Riley Cooper, if it wasn't for, for Michael Vick. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have been close to the success that they had 
with the Bucs there. So I think I think Vic could come to the Jets organization and, and definitely mentor, but he's going to win the starting job. You know, Smith isn't good enough, in my opinion. Vic's going to get the starting job, and then he's going to get hurt, and then Geno Smith is going to come back in. Because Michael Vick always gets hurt. Write that down in ink. It's going to happen. Well, I... Like, it's like Andy Reid's going to throw the ball on, on the first play of the game. Mark it down. It's going to happen. And Vic <laughs> will get hurt. And then Geno Smith comes back in, and round and round we go, quarterback controversy plus injury. And, and that's why they're in such a rabbit hole there in New York that they signed Vic. I, I think so anyway. Well, when you look at how Michael Vick's career has progressed, he hasn't finished a complete season since his time with the Falcons. And I actually have him down that if he goes to the Jets, and if he wins the starting job, he'll be out of he'll be injured by week five, and Gina exactly. Smith will be starting by week six. Uh, but, exactly. You know, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you. That's at least one thing the Jets would have going for them. They they, they supposedly drafted a franchise quarterback in Geno Smith, and when you have Michael Vick on your roster, you need two number one quarterbacks. Your organization needs two number one quarterbacks because Michael Vick will get hurt. He will get hurt, and you can't play half the season with a backup. So you need two number one quarterbacks. And the Jets potentially will have two number one quarterbacks if they sign Vic. So that's that's good news. Well, certainly they'll have Vic, they'll have Sanchez, and they'll have Geno Smith uh, all together on that roster. Lastly, before I let you go, one more question about the Jets. They bring in Eric Decker. And now he's a guy who has probably a lot of inflated numbers in Denver playing with mm-hmm. Peyton Manning. A lot of people are questioning his ability to be a number one wide receiver. The Jets certainly paid him like a number one wide receiver. Do you think the Jets overpaid for Decker? But on the other side of the coin, they needed him, no? Absolutely. That's, they definitely needed him, but they definitely overpaid for him. And I do believe he could be a number one. So <laughs> hope you can lump all those together and make sense out of it. Go ahead and try. I'm, I'm struggling myself, but now, he is a he is a really good receiver. He put up big numbers with Tim Tebow throwing the ball. He put up good numbers with uh, you know it was Tebow and Orton, I believe Kyle Orton. Right. And and you know he can do it on the field. He's a great player. He's a big body. He can he can run. My problem, my problem that he's going to have in New York is who's throwing the ball. Geno Smith can't throw the ball. Michael Vick can't throw the ball. These guys aren't accurate. So if you're not accurate, you're not going to get the catches. And most importantly, what Peyton Manning does probably better than anybody in the NFL, except for Nick Foles. I'm going to give Nick Foles credit here. I love Nick Foles. <laughs> All right, Nick but Foles in society right here. But Peyton Manning keeps wide receivers on the run after the catch. He puts the ball in a spot where they catch it in stride and they keep running. We saw Eric Decker do it all year, Demary right. Thomas, the whole crew. We, Michael Vick cannot do that. Geno Smith cannot do that. At least they haven't proven it. Geno Smith only has one year, so – Maybe he can, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he can, he can improve. Michael Vick cannot do it. He will throw the ball. It will get there, but it will be in a tough spot. He will have to break stride, and it turns a five-yard – it turns a, it turns what could be a 30-yard te- catch into a five-yard catch. And that's what Michael Vick – and that, that's why Deshaun Jackson put up career numbers last year because Nick Foles was throwing him the ball, catching it on the run. Deshaun oh. Jackson didn't put up career numbers. He didn't get 1,000 yards with Michael Vick throwing him the ball. Jeremy right. Mack has never had 1,000 yards in a season because he had Michael Vick throwing him the ball. Deshaun Jackson had McNabb, who we all know throws the ball at the ankles almost every darn time. So he finally has a guy who can throw to him on the run. And that's not what Decker has right now. So I think his numbers certainly will not reach what they hope or what he reached in Denver. But... I think, you know, he still is an improvement. And they, they, they need weapons. Frankly, they need weapons. And it's a shame for Eric Decker that he's the only one because they still have a long way to go in the weapons department. Well, certainly they have a long way to go. And there's also the draft that we have to wait and see how that pans out and yeah. how that fares for the Jets. I know you used to play football in Annapolis, and you say Navy, but I say Army. My dad's in the Army, so I will say <laughs> Go Army, beat Navy, and the next time those two meet, Kyle Eckel, a former Saint Super Bowl winner with them in 2009 and a former Philadelphia Eagle, always a pleasure. Hey, hey, the pleasure's all mine. Anytime, bud. All right, take care. That was Kyle Eckel joining me here on Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi on allnoiseradio.com, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, and simulcasted on israelsportsradio.com as the Yussi G Show. We're going to have a little sports update coming up, and then we're going to be right back in the action, a little basketball, and then we have Juan Ringo 
Coming up a little later on in the show, talking a little World Cup, Radio.com, and the Yossi G Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. I'm Yossi Goldstein with your All Noise Radio Sports Update. The Phillies beat the Blue Jays earlier today, 6-1 to in Grapefruit League action, and the Red Sox and Yankees are just getting underway in Fort Myers. Meanwhile, in the NFL, the Eagles continue to dodge questions about Deshaun Jackson's future with the Birds. Comcast Sports Nets' Derek Gunn has the latest. The Eagles basically had notified Deshaun Jackson early last week that they are not actively shopping him around the league, but they are listening to any possible suitors. And I was also informed that the Eagles right now are looking at possibly a third-round pick at the lowest and maybe an additional pick. That sound courtesy of CSNPhilly.com. According to reports, the Jets and free agent quarterback Michael Vick are close to an agreement that would bring the embattled QB to New York. Should that deal go through, Vick and current starter Geno Smith would battle for the starting role this summer. This A&R Sports Update has been brought to you by Chabad Packer, where you go for all your kosher travel needs. That's C-H-A-B-A-D Packer. Look them up on Facebook or at ChabadPacker.com. Honey, again you're sitting here sulking? I hate my job and I don't know what to do to change it. Get off the couch and go check out the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. The Connecticut School of Broadcasting? What's that? The Connecticut School of Broadcasting offers a career and lifestyle change through a broadcasting experience you won't ever forget. Log on to GoCSB.com to find out how a career in broadcasting is for you and not just the people you see on TV or hear on the radio. CSB focuses on many aspects of real-world broadcasting and their knowledgeable instructors teach you through a hands-on approach so you're in the studio in no time. To find out how CSB can help you work in an industry you love, call 1-800-TV-RADIO or check us out online at Go csb.com. Why work 50 weeks a year for a two-week vacation when you can enjoy your job every day? Don't just sit there. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to gocsb.com. Thanks, Thanks CSB. CSB. All Noise Radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore. Radio powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, simulcasted as the Yussie G Show with IsraelSportsRadio.com. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to basketball, especially now March Madness getting underway. Today we already had two big upsets, one of which I call that being Harvard beating Cincinnati, and the other, of course, being Dayton beating, defeating, edging, clipping, however you want to call it. Ohio State University, their big brothers, so to speak, within that state uh, by a score of 60 to 59. So certainly now, of course, we also have, uh, you know, shortly to get underway, Villanova number two ranked in their conference and it'll in their region. It'll be very interesting to see how they fare throughout the tournament. But to, to talk about that and uh, we'll be on it shortly uh, Ari Bluestein, the voice of the Drexel Dragons. Uh, but first, I want to get into a little bit of NBA, the Knicks, Phil Jackson. Why the Phil Jackson, James Dolan marriage is going to end up in an ugly, an, in an ugly divorce. Phil Jackson, James Dolan, this was not going to be a match made in heaven because when you have one guy making a monumental salary, astronomical. Phil Jackson is calling $12 million a year for five years, and he understands that the reason why he was able to get this was because of his leverage with the Knicks that he has with his two championships that he won while he was there, and 11 NBA titles as a coach. So when you have a guy who has this much coming in, Firstly, you know that there's going to be a lot of pressure to win and to win now. The question, though, with Jackson is, will he be around enough to actually focus and ensure that he gives the appropriate attention towards those aspects, that the little things that go into making a team from a pretender to a contender? He's used to doing it from the coaching perspective, but from the front office perspective, it's a little bit more than just a triangle offense. It's a little bit more than just the triangle defense. It's a little bit more than just playing those types of, of methods that he's used to having his teams play. Phil Jackson calling the shots from the front office demands a lot more of a different approach from Phil himself. He's got Janie Buss, his fiance on the other side of the country, 
in Los Angeles with the Lakers. He's got a nice, lovely cabin up in Montana somewhere. And the question, of course, comes back to will he be able to do enough in order for the Knicks, who are low on draft picks, low on draft picks, they're low on assets, they're very long on bad contracts and bad knees. And when you look at even some of the most elite front office executive, it's a challenging job to come into the Knicks and really change things up and the way that the franchise is viewed overall in the NBA world and put it on a good path going forward. Never mind a 68-year-old who never worked a day in his life in the front office and he is going to really get a lot of criticism as soon as that second gussing comes out and that's bound to come out because it's a rebuild job. James Dolan believes that Phil Jackson's star power is better, can be better eventually than Pat Riley's in Miami. It'll be better than Pat Riley on the free agent market, and it'll be better than Pat Riley overall in the sphere of the NBA. But make no mistake, before a GM can go chase free agent stars, there has to be an infrastructure of good, young, and inexpensive talent that comes through savvy scouting and creativity through deal-making. And Phil Jackson, I don't know if he's going to be able to just snap his fingers and just bring talent to his roster, expedite talent to the roster that the Knicks have right now, a roster that really is bare bones. What comes out on the other side, in terms of where James Dolan sits as the owner of the Knicks, is autonomy. Will he grant Phil Jackson the same amount, the complete, full-scale, broad autonomy like he did with Isaiah Thomas? Isaiah Thomas, he was given full autonomy, just complete, you know, reigns, do whatever you want, and there was excess of wasteful spending, dysfunction, and it, the losing, just losing year after year, it reverberated throughout the Knicks fan base, it reverberated throughout the entire franchise for more than a decade. Will James Dolan be able to take that same mindset that he went into in the beginning with Isaiah Thomas, giving him the reins, giving him the autonomy to do as he pleased, sit back and watch the show and hope that it turns out a little differently than it did with Thomas? Or will he say that he's giving him the autonomy, but at the end of the day, when Jackson comes, push comes to shove, he's going to call it back and, and, and make that final decision? Well, we're going to ask that, uh, that and more to the voice of the Drexel Dragons and SFBN CEO, Ari Bluestein. Ari, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thank God. Doing well here. Uh, I know you're, you've are you been very busy lately, and I understand that, especially considering the NCAA tournament really getting underway today already. You had a, earlier on Dayton taking out Ohio State, and of course, my pick, Harvard, beating Cincinnati. Uh, but before we get into... Uh, 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 you know, just those specific games. What What's the overall picture that you're hoping to get from this NCAA tournament uh, through it all? Well, my uh, final four in my uh, main bracket, I still out a few, but I have my main one where I consider, okay, these are my picks if I had to just enter one. Uh, I have Arizona, Florida, Iowa State, and Michigan as my final four. Um, along the way, I think obviously there's going to be a lot of upsets. I did pick the Dayton one. Um, I thought Harvard would have a chance to beat Cincinnati. I did not select that in my main bracket, but, you know, good for them. I definitely knew that that was a possibility, and uh, I think there could be a couple more uh, along the way. And um, I love the uh, – they're now the third-round upsets where you have, like, the eight, seven, six seeds upsetting the one, two, and three seeds. And I think we could see that. I think uh, we could see Kentucky knock off Wichita State. That's a really tough matchup for the Shockers. Uh, we could see New Mexico knock off Kansas, who will probably be without Joel Embiid. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't put it past uh, the winner of Baylor and Nebraska to knock off Creighton as well. So I think there's a lot of potential upsets, but in the end, I like Florida and Arizona to meet in a national title game. 
Well, we certainly have a couple mutual friends who would love to see that happen. And it will be a lot of fun to watch that because when you when you look at some of these teams, I mean, they're, these are players of the future for the NBA, and these are guys who really can play and they can really bring it. But when you look at some of the matchups and you look at some of the top teams, there's, of course, Wichita State. They haven't lost at all this season, but they're not getting, shall we say, the uh, appropriate respect for a number one. And then there are teams like New Mexico, which can really take it a long, long distance. And, you know, we'll see what happens with that. I mean, my final four is New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, uh, Iowa State and Wichita. And Wichita State. So we'll see what happens with that. But moving on to the New York Knicks and, and what's been going on there and just the dysfunction that is with the Knicks organization. They bring in Phil Jackson and hope that the Zen master will have something up his sleeve from a position that he's never had before. Where do you think this is going to end up, the relationship between James Dolan and Phil Jackson with the Knicks? I'm not really sure where it's going to end up. I think Dolan has to let Phil work. Uh, he has to let him do his job, get the right players, get the right coach in a position to make New York a winner again. Uh, if, if Dolan just let, gives Phil Jackson control, I feel like Phil could bring the Knicks back uh, to a championship contender. Uh, he knows, obviously, he's won plenty of rings with the Bulls and the Lakers, and also as a player with the Knicks. So uh, I think it's a good spot. And I think, you know, it's a guy that Knicks fans respect because he, he was in New York. So I think it's a good spot for Phil Jackson. Uh, and uh, obviously he's making a good chunk of change uh, by doing this. And I think Dolan should respect uh, his space and let the Zen master work. Well, we certainly know what happened the last time Jolin gave somebody the ability to do as they please. That was Isaiah Thomas, and that turned into a, a decade of dysfunction and wasteful spending. And uh, when you look at the team now, you have Carmelo says he's willing to do whatever it takes to win with Phil in New York and not go anywhere else. Where do you think Carmelo is going to end up uh, when push comes to shove? Another team, or will he stay in New York? Well, now that Phil is Jackson is there, uh, I would say he's going to stay. Um, I didn't really know where he was going to go um, and still make as much money as he's going to make. Uh, I think that uh, he'll stay in New York now. I, I thought maybe he would have a chance to leave, but now you know, it seems like with Phil Jackson there, it would really be dumb of him to leave and go somewhere else because he has a chance to build a team and make New York a winner, and that's kind of been one of the knocks on Carmelo is that he hasn't been able to win at the NBA level, uh, at least go a long way in the playoffs, that's for sure. Obviously, with Denver, they had some good teams, but they were never to get, able to get to the finals. So uh, I think that uh, he'll stay, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. Well, certainly it'll be interesting to see. You know, they have the fans protesting uh, Wednesday night last night before the Knicks beat the Pacers. And, the, you know, when it was announced that the Knicks, uh, the, these fans were going to be protesting, they suddenly, the Knicks went on a seven-game winning streak and signed Phil Jackson to a, f a five-year, $12 million per contract. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, Ari Bluestein, I always, it's a pleasure. We know you're very busy these days. The uh, voice of the Drexel Dragons joining me here on Sports. Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi, simulcasted as the SDG Show. Thanks so much for hopping on. I always try and make time for the Sports Rabbi. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Ari. Take care. That was Ari Bluestein, voice of the Drexel Dragons, joining me here on Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi on the SDG Show. And, you know, when you look at what the Knicks have and what, you know, they bring to the table, there's not a lot for reasons for why Carmelo would want to stay. But now that you have Phil Jackson, I would, if I was in his shoes, I would at least give it to the end of the season before I made my feelings uh, really go public. Uh, when I come back, we'll uh, have Juan Arango join us, uh, give us a little bit of an update as to what's going on in the soccer world and perhaps a little bit of a world cup powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. You know, our jobs occupy more than half our waking hours. Shouldn't we be doing something we love? Call Connecticut School of Broadcasting at 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. 
Since 1964, Connecticut School of Broadcasting, with a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami, has helped place thousands of grads as DJs, sportscasters, entertainment reporters, behind the scenes in audio and video production, every aspect of the broadcast media. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has trained men and women of all ages and backgrounds in a matter of months, not years. Learn by doing from area radio and TV pros. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. Day and evening classes begin soon. Get trained. Get connected now. Your computer is blowing up. Blowing up to the sounds of all noise radio. Powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. You're powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting and also simulcasted as the SVG show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. As always, 856-330-4749 to join in on the conversation, or you can shoot me a message on Twitter at the G T H E Y O S S I G, or send me a message on Facebook, Facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi. We're gonna change it up a little bit over here. This segment, uh, we'll talk a little soccer action european soccer uh specifically the Bundesliga. we're gonna have it here in a moment a writer who covers the team bo russia muchen gladbach in the german Bundesliga, joining me here giving us the update on the Bundesliga and what's going on in soccer in general especially with the world cup coming up and we're gonna have him on in a couple of moments to talk about what life is like uh, in germany for a foreign national and among other things but uh some of the things that have been interesting you know for me uh, soccer growing up, it's you know it's known as the world game, and I always really enjoyed playing it as as a kid and growing up through my teenage years into into my twenties. Always uh, had a good time with it. You never know the types of players that you're going to find uh, on the pitch. Uh, I never know the types of players where they come from, be they a fellow Americans, uh, Canadians, uh, South Americans, Europeans, players from. Africa, I mean, Asia, Australia, everywhere. Uh, that's what really makes the sport uh, a rather fun thing, not just to watch, but I think even more so uh, to play because everybody understands, you know, it's, it's, it's really simple. The game, the game itself speaks a world language where you don't really need that much to kind of go with. Uh, in and of itself, you get up, you go, you play, you you run around, you score goals, you play defense, and you know, then you move on from there. But in terms of uh, the different leagues in Europe, you, we all know uh, you have the Bundesliga in Germany, you have uh, the English Premier League, you have uh, La Liga in, in Spain, and they each have their own really good players, and they each have their own household names that you can find in the various leagues. And of course, I would say the EPL, the English Premier League, probably is the most famous one, also the richest one, because that's where a lot of the top-tier talent in the world go to play, because among other things, that is where they will get that payday that they so uh, so much seek, and rightfully so, you have the talent, go for it. But also, that is where it's shown that you can win the championships in that league mean the most because you're playing against the best talent in the world. And when you look at their cups, their FA Cup versus what you have elsewhere in uh, in, in La Liga in Spain or even the, uh, the, in the Bundesliga in Germany or even the Serie A in Italy, there is a, a, a little bit of a dearth of talent in those other leagues when you compare it to the lead to Germany and German's Bundesliga. I now have the pleasure and privilege of bringing on the correspondent for the Telegraph covering the Bundesliga in Germany onto Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi and the Yossi G Show, Juan Arango. Uh, how you doing, Yossi? Very good, very good. So let me ask you right off the bat, what's it like being a correspondent for the Telegraph covering the Bundesliga, the German soccer league, especially considering that you probably didn't grow up following the Bundesliga and watching the German teams play one another? Uh, I mean, as far as writing for the Telegraph, I mean, it, it was a great opportunity they gave me after seeing what I've been able to do with television here in the United States and also be able to do what I was, you know, in a, as far as writing for other, for other sites and, and whatnot. 
uh, it, it's quite interesting um, what's been going on. You know, so I mean, as far as as far as uh, you know, covering the Bundesliga over at Gold TV, you know, I had the great opportunity to have have worked over there before. Um, you know, it, it, it's a great opportunity, and, and, and working and working as the Colombian uh, correspondent for them, you know, it, it's one of the big opportunities that I've been able to really take advantage of, and truly, truly enjoying the experience that, that it's being, being able to offer me right now. Well, right now we have on here with me Juan Arango, a uh, correspondent with the Telegraph. Now, how is it when you look at the Bundesliga, when you look at the German soccer league as mm-hmm. what I would consider as an outsider? What were some of those, you know, steps that you had to make in order to to have those ins and get those contacts within the league, where players felt comfortable talking to you, where coaches felt comfortable having you around them as well as their team? What were some of the steps and stages that you had to go through in order to get to where you are right now? Uh, I mean, right now it's just pretty much acquiring, you know, being able to acquire their trust. As far as the contacts are concerned, I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure to to interview players like Dante, like Rafinha. Over at Bayern Munich, also spoken to Julian Draxler over at Schalke. Uh, you know, Lucas Podolski. Obviously, he used to play for Cologne, now playing with with Arsenal, and also played with Bayern Munich before. Um, it, it's just you know to try and give him a certain bit of comfort, I guess you know. And uh, eventually, things kind of fall into place. I mean, I mean, I'm one that really, and it's just just you know, this is just me from a personal standpoint. Um, it's more of being able to just not be too overbearing, too, too overwhelming, trying to bombard them with questions, trying to acquire a certain bit of a comfort zone with them. Uh, when interviewing them, be a little bit more personable. Those types of things that have really helped me as far as as far as being able to establish those contacts, maintaining those contacts, obviously, and trying to, to give as many bits of information that I possibly can from the players, from journalists, from coaches, from whoever I'm able to speak to it, It'd be able to, to make a story as well as also be able to, you know, give the most accurate possible news uh, that I can. So you're now you're now in the States, and we all know soccer is one of the, you know, nicknames for the sport is known as the world game. What have you seen between the you know, the play in Europe versus the growth of soccer in the United States. Has the United States made its own way towards closing that gap between its play and that of the top flight leagues in Europe? I, I don't think that my opinion would, would really validate what, what, what you're trying to find out there. I, I think the best opinion, and that opinion came about uh, maybe 24 hours ago or so, when Marco Fabian de la Mora, the Mexican international place for Cruz Azul came out and said after the match uh, between uh, Sporting Kansas City and uh, Cruz Azul of Mexico came out and said, you know what, MLS has grown. They've closed the gap. They're pretty much on par with the Mexican league. And, and mm-hmm. you speak to many uh, athletes, you speak, speak to many of the players in Europe. You also speak to some in South America too. And then they see MLS as an up and coming league. It's, it's a league that maybe people might want, you know, people say, well, it's not the Premier League, it's not this, it's not that. But still, it's a league within its limitations and also within uh, the exposure that it has, within everything that it surrounds MLS. It is, it's a pretty competitive league if you start looking at it from that perspective and also from the fact that it's um, almost 20 years old compared to the, the Premiership or compared to the Bundesliga or compared to La Liga that have nearly a century worth of, of – um, tournament action that they've been able to or a century worth of history that they've been able to accumulate so seeing that yeah it's it's a league that's growing uh you do see when you walk around big cities like new york like down here in miami uh that you see several people now with you know barcelona or real madrid or bayern munich or chelsea man man you know united any of those uh teams that you see people wearing those jerseys now it's very uh, it's become pretty embedded to a certain extent here in the U.S. as far as culture is concerned. So, I mean, it's taking the appropriate steps in the proper direction. Oh, I hear, certainly hear that. And joining me here on Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi on the SCG Show, Juan Arango, okay. the writer for correspondent for The Telegraph. Juan, we have the World Cup coming up around the corner. 
and mm -hmm. you look at some of the teams, some of the countries that are in the tournament, once every four years, this is the tournament that everybody is going to be tuned into in June. When you look at some of the countries that are there and you look at obviously the powerhouses like Germany, like Italy, like uh, of course the host nation Brazil, and then you look at some of the lesser known countries, who do you think is going to be that dark horse that has the potential to really make a nice long run in that tournament? God, I wish you would. I could say Colombia right now, but uh, they're, they're having some major issues defensively. But if they're able to get their act together uh, and you can find one of the many forwards that uh, are there to possibly replace Lada Mel Falcao, uh, you could see them getting maybe even to a semifinal round at least. Uh, and and I'm, I'm probably stretching at this point because of the defensive issues that uh, many started to see, especially in the friendly against Tunisia last week. Uh, Chile uh, is one that many are starting to jump on that bandwagon now. I mean, seeing how solid this team is. Um, seeing the possibility of maybe a Mauro Sarate, he plays for Vélez Sarfila in Argentina, mm -hmm. seeing him uh, possibly nationalizing and playing for the Chilean national team alongside a player like Mikel Bornos, add Alexis Sanchez as well, add, Maurice, um, add Isla as well, add also Arturo Vidal of Juventus. Um, you know, so you do have a very dynamic team there, uh, a team that will pressure, a team that will constantly try to stretch you out as, as much as you can and albeit they're playing in a group where they're facing the Netherlands as well as Spain, uh, they could be able to sneak out and, and maybe get, I don't know how deep, but they're able to make some, uh, some really top contenders cringe and, and give them a really hard time. And maybe you could see them get deep. So, I mean, Chile would be one of those teams, maybe Belgium, although Belgium on that side, maybe the experience factor is not quite there yet. Uh, Still, anything could happen. I, I see this World Cup so wide open right now. Uh, you know, it, it's Brazil in their own backyard, and many others right behind. Not by much, but right behind, and, and they could really cause some problems there as well. Well, we certainly know that when you have Brazil, you never in, in a tournament, you cannot really ever count them out until they have been knocked out. So it certainly should be a very uh, fun and exciting tournament, one where I know a lot of people who uh, are listening are really ho crossing their fingers and hoping that the U.S. might somehow be able to find their way out of the group of death, the so-called uh, group of death. And I know that you're probably rooting for Colombia, uh, you know, with, with that as your heritage and background, uh, especially when you consider that some of the other neighboring countries uh, in South America are not in it, such as Venezuela. Uh, Juan, thank you so much for the time. We're up on our break over here. I always appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with you and hop on here for a couple minutes, Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi, and on the SUG hey. show. Hey, thank you very much, and shout out to all the listeners. All right, thanks a lot, man. That was Juan Orengo, a correspondent for The Telegraph, uh, covering the Bundesliga in Germany with a little World Cup update. That'll do it for this show. I'd like to give a little shout out for everybody who chimed in on Twitter and uh, on Facebook, and of course to Kyle Eckel and Ari Bluestein for having the time to hop on with me on this busy first day in March Madness NCAA tournament action and of course the rest of the sports world. So long farewell off Twitter Zen and good by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting simulcast it as the OCG show on israelsportsradio.com until next time. All those radio Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. All Noise Radio is an internet radio station that's fully produced by graduates of the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. From modern rock to old school hip hop, country to classical, news, talk, sports, and more. It's the noise you can't ignore. Log on to allnoiseradio.com. Fire up the station. Find out more about your favorite jocks. Get the latest CSB news and more. Plus, you can take All Noise Radio with you on the go for free. Just download the Live 365 app to your iPhone, iPod Touch, or BlackBerry and search All Noise Radio. Check out tomorrow's broadcasters today at allnoiseradio.com. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. All Noise Radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore.